you know, one thing about these songs is they're very ancient, so everyone wants to always uh, kind of curate them or something, like touch them with a brush. But uh, while they're ancient, and it's like if you go to a museum and you grab something that's very, very old, you know, and you, it's one thing to look at it, it's another thing to touch it. It's kind of another thing to use it. Um, with our songs, they're very ancient. They're older than those things are in the museum. But at the same time, um, we're still singing them. We're still using them. We're still in the process of it being around us, part of our lives. Uh, a lot of times people look at us coming eye and they expect us to, uh, you know, I guess I could have walked in kind of half nude or something, or <laughs> they want us to put on some kind of headdress or something like that. Um, but we live in modern times and this is how we dress, but we're still the same people. And we still have that, that attribute that's very ancient. So what does bird look like today? It does look a little bit different than it probably looked um, 200 years ago um, or 1,000 years ago. Are the songs any different? I, you know, I heard a recording one time, old, old recording, <coughs> and they didn't sing the song the exact same way I sing it. You know, the rhythm wasn't really changed. It was pretty, pretty much what it was. Um, the words, everything was the same. Uh, you know, I, I saw a, in writing one time, they had some of our hand game songs, they wrote it down, and I, and I had some and people that play hand, our hand games, our peon games, and um, young ones, I say, hey, you recognize that? And they read through it, and they're like, no. And I, I, so I, I read it like a dozen times before I can hear it, and I was like, oh, I know what they're trying to write. And so I sang it to them, and they're like, oh, yeah, I know that song, but that was written 100 years earlier. But we use it. The little kids sing it, you know, on a Saturday night at a, at a gathering. They're singing the song. The songs are very, very old. So uh, what does bird like, look like today, you know? I mean, it could look a lot of things. You know, sometimes I'll wear a, a ribbon shirt. And what that represents is, you know, maybe the last 60 years of, of our people who, um, as they were bringing a lot of these, these customs into a public forum again, because we were repressed. You would get in trouble. Our people could die singing these songs. Uh, especially if we broadcasted them out. So when our people did bring them out, they were in the post-boarding school era, and they were forced, they had to dress Americanized. They had to dress, uh, you know, early on it was the Victorian era dress, and all the boarding schools are, are you know, little girls, they were, they were told you make a dress this way, and that's how you wear it. So they did, but they put on ribbons, and they decorated, and they colored it, um, something that would represent their stories, their heritage, their ways, and the boys do the same with their shirts. So you go all across America and you'll see ribbon shirts and that kind of ribbon. People in this area go, oh, that's my bird singing shirt. Uh, but it really speaks to that time period. And, and for me, you know, I wear those. I think it looks good. I put my boys in that. Same time, I'll go sing, you know, with a uh, um, button-up shirt or something like that. I always wear pants. Long ago, our people didn't wear pants. But I wore them because who I learned from was a man. He was a grown man. It's my father. Uh, the guys I sang with that were older, they were... You know, that's how they dress, so I dress like them, you know. The, the, does the, the dress make the song? No, you could show up in a pair of Speedos. Um, I would argue you're not disrespecting the song because our old ones did almost go naked. So it does, the look of it may change, but the meaning, the philosophy behind it, the songs, the melody, all of those things that are key and integral do not change. So you see me today in my shirt, and I thought I would be youthful because I really wanted to remind all of you, um, and I know that we look into history, I teach history too, and I know it's all old stuff, all old, we always think in the past, think in the past. Um, but these songs, while we're looking before time, we're looking way, way, uh, yeah, way back in the day, ancient, they're, they're here still. And they're not here with us or a bunch of, we're going to cart in an old guy to talk about these songs. You know, we're all pretty young guys still. You know, by our standards, it's coming out. None of us are elders. Who? Stan, I say he's a <laughs> uh, But we're, we're young. I went to go sing somewhere last week, and they, they referred to me as Elder Christmas. And, oh, man, everybody was giving me a hard time. I'm, I really am young by standards, you know. Uh, I'm not even, I'm literally not even halfway to an elder amongst what our people think of. Because our people used to live to be 100 years old very commonly. We had a, a very diverse diet, very healthy lifestyle, walking these lands. I mean, our people go from beyond the coast into the ocean because now the sea level is high. But all the way to the Colorado River, south and to the northern part of Mexico, up north. So we're, this is our traditional boundary, you know, ancient boundary. We had a very diverse diet. We walked. We were very healthy. We lived over 100 years old. So you don't call a 50-year-old person an elder when you're living to be 100. And that's so our traditional view has always been, hey, in your mid-70s, 80s, that, they will start talking to you about you being an older person the last quarter of your life. 
Uh, but someone that's not even half that, oh, you're just a young kid. You don't even know what it is to get old yet. Me, I'm just a baby. Um, sadly, sadly, in our more our recent hundred, uh, you know, last hundred years, uh, in a community where I live, the average age of death is 43 years old. That's here in San Diego County. And the reason why we know that's because we have all those records now because we, you know, we have uh, economic development and we provide health care for our own people. We're able to trace all the numbers and then look back in time to our cemetery and how old was everybody dying and how did they die and all of these things. So that's very scary as a person coming towards that age. Um, but we're, we're improving ourselves. So when you look at traditional understandings, traditional ways of thinking and our songs that reflect all that, plugging it into a new world, this new way of life, it can be very, it can be very uh, hard sometimes to retrofit that. When I'm, when I'm trying to say I'm not an elder, or Stan's not an elder, I kind of have to look at Stan and say, no nah, man, I hate to bust it to you, but you are getting to those ages because in a traditional sense, no, you're not an elder, you're not even close. But in a modern sense, we don't have people that are, are in their 80s and 90s walking around. We don't have that anymore because our people, have, have, you know, they've um, prematurely passed on. My parents are, you know, my mom's mid 70s, and and I think a lot of people think she's, you know, so old. She's so old. And my mom don't go around talking that. She's like, I'm not old. But people look at her that way because it's not common to have our old people live these these lifestyles that we had 200 years ago. So the shirt, yeah, I, I, it's it's my uh, my new bird shirt, my new Kumiai bird shirt. And for me, it was important to have my son on there, have one of my sons, they all sing, but my youngest one, um, because he's just a little guy, and this was him a few years ago. And I'm proud of him, I'm proud of the road that these guys are taking. Um, and I'm proud that they're, they're you know, it's video games, they're sports, but um, they're willing to do it, you know? I don't have to force them too much, but, you know, usually it's like, hey, I'm going to sing, you going? And they're like, yeah, so they jump in, and it's that easy. Same time, you know, uh, when I was a kid, it was like that. My dad said, I'm going to sing, all right, I'll jump in. And I've had that opportunity. And so all of we're talking about cannot happen. It cannot happen if there's not an older person willing to reach down and talk to a young kid. It just doesn't happen, okay? There's, we're not in, uh, in the school system, you know? It's not like you have to go to school. Our lessons are taught in the home traditionally, but after the post-boarding school era, a lot of homes didn't have that knowledge anymore. So it really took the effort of somebody young to say to an older person, I want to learn. And then older people willing to, to reach down and say, okay, I'll teach you. I'll spend time with you. Um, when I was a teenager, I'd already, you know, I sang for a dozen years, uh, 15, 16, somewhere in there. Um, my dad's health went kind of, went really, went really uh, bad. I had, a, I had a brother who was older than me and he passed on um, down in, in, the, in the coastline. And um, he, was a, he was in high school, it was real hard on my family. He was a singer. He probably would have been the singer of our family, but he passed on. So I'm just a young kid coming through. My parents are older, my brother's kind of lost interest. So I took that on me, I, I took that on. Uh, probably ninth grade, 10th grade, where I said, you know what, this is something I want to do. And so from that time to now, there's a saying, I try to go there and listen, I listen to how it's, you know, and I've, and I've had the opportunity to have a lot of singers take me in. And like I said, a lot of uh, guys that are passed on now, you know, and, and uh, we're always appreciative of them. Uh, my cousin, uh, Paul Cuero, out of Campo, beautiful singer, strong voice. You talk about projecting voice. He's, uh, you know, he's probably got the strongest voice um, of, of all the bird singers from here to the Grand Canyon that I've, I've, I've met. Uh, my cousin John Chrisman, another guy like that, sings a different song cycle, sings with Shaw. And he also has the ability to project one of the strongest voices of all the bird world. Um, and there's a lot of good singers out there. And these guys can do it all night long like that. And, uh, you know, I don't even sing with Shaw, but I'll go, I'll go sing with my cousin. Uh, you know, the other night I was singing with him. And I can hang and help him out a little bit because I, I like to do that sometimes. I like, I like you know, the, the music and all that part of it too. And I understand a little bit and I like to support my family. But um, my cousin Junior, you know, when, when, when I started singing with him, he had his own crew, you know. Uh, one of his main guys is in the back. Um, Steve, he says it's his brother, um, and it truly is through bird singing means, but, you know, he's taken in many people and, and, uh, and said, you know, you can come sing with me, and you go there and you learn, and sometimes when you're young, you know, or you don't, you sing a little different, you, you can mess up the line a little bit, you can be that gourd that's off, or you can sing a little funky, 
Um, and when I was going through my teenager years, my voice is cracking. You know, he never, never once did him or or Steve or those guys say, "Hey, man, you sound bad. Stop singing." You know, and they were always encouraging. And so that's what it takes, you know. So me, as a, as a guy that now has my own little crew and guys that come to me and want to sing with me, they're younger, I always try to encourage them. Um, they may not come from this background. They may not come from it. They may not understand it much, but they take pride in it and they want to do it. I'll teach them what I can, what I know. And, and I try to teach in a more traditional way. Um, I, you know, as the old ones would say, if you're going to learn this, you have to be around it. You have to follow that singer almost to the point they don't want you around. It's like, man, I can't get rid of this guy. You have to do that. You have to always be willing to listen to learn. And you have to be there when you're tired. You have to be there when you're not feeling it. And if um, my cousin's gonna sing and I tell him I'm gonna be there to help you sing, and it's four in the morning and I worked, I got up at 4.30 that morning to go work, and I had a long day and I had to go run errands and then I gotta go sing, I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna be there all night again. And if the next day I have to go to a gathering because I promised a community I was there to sing, then I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna sing. And if I told my peon team that I'm gonna play peon with you and they all prepared, I'm gonna stay up another night. And if that means I have to be up 48, 50 hours, then I'll do it. And that's just what it is. Um, and you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a labor of love. And uh, if I can get an hour here, 20 minutes there, then I'll take, I will. If I can get a driver, I'll take it. But if I have to drive, then I will. And that's just, that's what it is. That's the dedication to our practice. This is not chanting. This isn't us putting on, as I uh, said earlier, a, pony, a dog and pony show. This is a lifestyle. And so um, I try to show my, my students that, anybody who comes sings with me, you know, that this is something that maybe they as fathers one day will sing to their kids like I do to my kids, as my dad did to me. Show it to me, you sing to them, you spend the time with them. You show them. You don't talk about it. You show them. This is what it's like. My dad's retired from California. Uh, well, CDF was called. Now it's Cal Fire. He retired from that. Not a lot of our people have retired from occupations like that. But he did that as a bird singer. So I can't make the excuse that, oh, I got to go teach. I got to work. And I said, I don't got time to sing. Because he already showed me you can do both. You might be tired. You might be wore out. But you can do both. So I do both. Show my kids that. So I'll show those boys. You can go to college if you want to, but you can also do this. It's not either or. You can do both. But how bad do you want it? How deep it in you is it? Don't make excuses. Do it. So you know, when you think of those terms, you start thinking life lessons. That's when you start really getting into the power of these songs. When I when I have kids that don't know me or don't know my family or don't aren't related to me or I didn't grow up with their parents or something, other communities, um, hey Ralph, can my son come sing with you? Absolutely, bring him. I try to mirror what I saw others do to me. And sometimes older people have been harsh on me. You know, I've seen old people be harsh to other people. You know, hey, don't play a gourd that way. Um, someone really messing up, grown man, grab the gourd. Hey, don't, don't do that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a, a lesson of love, you know. And, um, but I, I try to do the best practices that was, was taught to me. So when I was a teenager, being accepted in by these singers, being able to sing with other guys, uh, I try to do that with my boys as best as possible and to support, truly support. Because you get up to sing and no people won't come sing with you, it does hurt you a little bit. People won't get up and dance for you, that can be hurtful. People will sit there, watch, and see how you do stuff. Maybe they don't feel like dancing, maybe they don't like you. I don't know. But I was taught in that time period to support each other. So, you know, if my cousin uh, Paul's gonna get up and sing, you know, I do my best to go there and help him sing. That's my relative. I have an ob obligation to do that. Um, and I tell my boys, go sing. Um, if Dan right here is, again, another one of my relatives, if he's singing his songs and he don't got his whole crew there, I tell my boys, go dance for him. Those are our songs. We have to continue that. We have to support him as a singer. Um, there's another singer out of uh, Campo, young guy, younger than all of us. Um, uh, Fred Largo, he sang his whole life like me, young kid all the way up. And uh, I jump in, help him out, tell my boys, go, you know, let's go dance for this guy. We go around different areas, let's go sing with these guys. Um, I, was, I was in Yuma the other night, you know, and there's an old singer out there, you know, in his 70s, he was out there singing. And, and uh, you know, we go to these places like that and you see these people, we live this lifestyle, we support each other like that. That's what it's about. I didn't make that up. I didn't kind of, oh, we should start supporting each other. That's not how it works. That was taught to me. And if I did have that idea, it was probably given to me already when I was a kid. So 
I try to teach these things to the kids as best as possible. So the shirt, yeah, for me, you always see a bunch of kids around me because that's how I learned. I was a little kid when I learned. I was a teenager when I learned these things. I was a young man when I learned these things. So it's important for me to always look to the future, to the young ones, and say, if these songs will continue, you have to do them. And you can't wait until you're 35 and you wanna, you wanna uh, leave a legacy real quick. No, you start when you're, when you're three years old, little kid, all right, start listening to the rhythm. Learn how to dance. It's good to know how to dance when you're a teenager. You know, if you're a teenager, don't wait till, you know, don't go do your little, uh, I wanna get all my demons out first. Go do it now, go over there, go sit by that old person. You never know how long we're going to be here. You know, you just never know. Your teacher might be there today, may not be there tomorrow. This might be the only chance you have at hearing some of this stuff. There's songs I've heard thousands and thousands of times. The songs I've sang thousands and thousands of times. You cannot take that for granted. That that might be the last time you sing that song. Or the last time you hear it. You don't know. It might be. It might be my last opportunity. The other night I heard that old guy, he sang a song in the early morning. And I'm over here trying to sing with my cousin. But I heard him sing a song that I haven't heard. I know that some of the, there's a, there's a song just like it. Same rhythm, similar word, the way the words go out. We call it a brother. Because you sing one, there's four or five that match that <coughs> song, but they're different words. So they tell a little different part of that story. He sang a song that I hadn't heard. I know all the songs, but I didn't know that one. So I'm sitting there singing with him, but I'm trying to listen to him. Now there is a moment you go, where's your priorities? I should have been over there helping them. I'd have known that song better. But I heard that song and I, I got it checked in my brain. And so when I'm driving back two hours drive, that's all that's in my brain. And I can, I can learn it because, um, first off, maybe I already knew it, just didn't know I knew it. Maybe I learned it was a kid. First off, I don't know. Another thing is because I know the brothers too and I know what the story's about in that chunk. So it makes perfect sense that song would be sung. So I was able to hear about 30 seconds and get it real quick. But again, you know, that's, uh, that takes time. It's a, you know, Rome was not built in a week. 